SpaceX announced on Friday that the company is targeting mid-November for the second flight test of the Super Heavy rocket and its Starship upper stage. The second flight test of a fully integrated Starship could launch as soon as mid-November, pending regulatory approval, the company said on X. Sources suggest the launch could be as soon as November 13. SpaceX will again target a morning liftoff for the rocket perhaps around 8 a.m. local time in South Texas, 14.0 UTC. The flight timeline and profile released by the company on Friday for the second flight test is similar to April's test, calling for a 90-minute flight of the Starship upper stage, which is intended to nearly complete a full orbit before splashing down into the Pacific Ocean near the island of Kauai. One notable change is the addition of a hot staging ring between the Super Heavy booster and the Starship upper stage. This technique will call for the Starship's Raptor engines to ignite before the upper stage separates from the Super Heavy first stage. This is more technically challenging than waiting for stage separation, but will eventually result in a higher payload to orbit capability for Starship. SpaceX will not seek to recover either the first or second stage on this flight. The goal, instead, is to prove the flight capabilities of the Super Heavy rocket and, if the stack reaches separation, the performance of Starship. Musk has said he thinks there is about a 60% chance that Starship will reach its destination on this flight. To know that right or wrong, SpaceX still said the launch date is pending regulatory approval. Those regulatory hurdles surrounding the fully reusable launch vehicle are now mainly centered around the conclusion of an environmental review, which is in the hands of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Earlier this week, the Federal Aviation Administration said it had concluded the Starship Super Heavy Safety Review. In a statement, the agency said the environmental review is the last major element to complete before the FAA makes a license determination. SpaceX will debut a number of upgrades to both the rocket itself, as well as the launch infrastructure, including their new hot stage separation system and an electronic thrust vector control (TVC) system. The FWS has been evaluating one of the key upgrades since IFT-1, the water-cooled steel flame deflector AK the water deluge system, reached for comment early Friday morning. An FWS spokesperson said they didn't have any updates to provide regarding their progress. As was the case with the IFT-1 mission earlier this year, NASA has been eagerly watching the progress of Starship. SpaceX only has so much time to move through the evolutions of Starship before it's needed to operate as the first vehicle that will be a part of the Human Landing System program within the overall Artemis program. During 2024, SpaceX is expected to demonstrate its ability to transfer propellant from one Starship vehicle in orbit to another, a key milestone needed within the architecture of safely getting the spacecraft to the moon, down to the surface, and back into lunar orbit. That will be a really key indicator as to their readiness level, said Lisa Watson Morgan, the HLS program manager. And once they get to that point, and once that is achieved, it's much smaller from there on out. That propellant transfer mission will also call upon at least one additional orbital launch mount, which adds to the importance of being able to demonstrate either the success of the changes made or showcase what still needs to be adjusted. Watson Morgan shared last month that this iterative approach can be tricky to step through, but makes things more simplified by the end of the testing campaign. And so what that means is by the time they're at the end of their test campaign, they're pretty much ready to fly. It's more of a just. Here's the rest of the documentation. Let's go in and certify, Watson Morgan said. So while yes, these are early developmental flights, and they're not what the human landing system Starship will be, in that it doesn't have our life support, it doesn't have our comm system, it doesn't have those aspects, but it is still very important and required. So for us, schedule is key. We'll see when launch number two ends up on the schedule. Now, before we come to the next part, our team wants to apologize to all of you for today's audio quality. Our voice reader has some problems and was absent. To ensure that the news is updated for you, we must use an alternative voice. Mr. Kevin will be back in the next episode. So we hope for your understanding and continue to support us. All right, back to the main part. SpaceX broke its own rocket reuse record on Friday. A Falcon 9 rocket.
launched 23 of SpaceX's Starlink Internet satellites to orbit from Florida's Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 8.37 p.m. EDT. It was the unprecedented 18 mission for this Falcon 9's first stage, according to a SpaceX mission description. The Falcon 9's first stage came back to Earth to make a vertical landing about 8.5 minutes after launch on the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, which was stationed in the Atlantic Ocean a few hundred miles off the Florida coast. The Falcon 9's upper stage, meanwhile, continued hauling the 23 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. The spacecraft will be deployed there about 65.5 minutes after liftoff. SpaceX and its billionaire founder and CEO Elon Musk have long prioritized the reusability of spaceflight hardware, seeing it as a key breakthrough that will enable Mars settlement and other ambitious exploration feats. The company therefore keeps pushing the reuse envelope. The previous Falcon 9 record of 17 flights, for example, was set on SEPT. 19 and tied just four days later. Many of these Falcon 9 missions have been dedicated to building out Starlink SpaceX's broadband mega constellation in LAO, which currently consists of nearly 5,000 operational satellites. The Falcon 9 that flew on Friday evening, for instance, already had 12 Starlink missions under its belt, according to the SpaceX mission description. In another good news, a NASA official opened the door to keeping the International Space Station in operation beyond 2030 if commercial space stations are not yet ready to take over by the end of the decade. Speaking at the Beyond Earth Symposium here on November 2, Ken Bowersock's NASA Associate Administrator for Space Operations said it was not mandatory to retire the ISS as currently planned at the end of the decade, depending on the progress companies are making on commercial stations. The timeline is flexible, he said of that transition from the ISS to commercial stations. It's not mandatory that we stop flying the ISS in 2030, but it is our full intention to switch to new platforms when they're available. NASA and the other Western partners on the ISS Canada, Europe, and Japan have all agreed to operate the ISS until 2030. Russia, the other partner, has agreed to only 2028, which NASA officials previously stated is linked to the Russian space agency Roscosmos operating in four-year increments when planning the station's future, in this case, from 2024 to 2028. NASA has been supporting the development of commercial stations, which the agency calls commercial low-Earth orbit destinations, with the goal of having one or more such stations in orbit and certified for use by NASA astronauts by the late 2020s. That would enable a transition from the ISS to the commercial facilities by 2030, followed by deorbiting the ISS. Bowersox acknowledged that the schedule depends on the readiness of those commercial stations. When it happens is going to depend a lot the maturity of the market, he said, which includes both the status of commercial stations and non-NASA customers for them. He made it clear that NASA does not expect to be the only customer for commercial stations. NASA's current requirements for those stations anticipate having two astronauts at a time on them, less than the ISS. We looked at what we thought would be reasonable and what would actually give us a cost savings, he said of that requirement. My biggest concern is if we get too far ahead of where the market and NASA has to carry the full cost of the platforms for longer and we transition too quickly, he said. That could force NASA to move money from current ISS utilization to support those stations. If we have a badly managed transition, we could find ourselves getting weak in those areas. The comments come amid industry concerns about NASA's budget and how much funding it will have available to support the CLD effort. Some have privately worried that overall budget pressures on the agency could reduce funding for CLD and force an extension of the ISS beyond 2030. That's all, folks. If you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration. And until next time, keep looking up.